Margaret Robinson. I identify as bisexual, queer, and two-spirit, um, and uh, sort of in that order. Uh, I came out as bisexual, then later as queer, and then eventually as two-spirit, um, and now I just use them all. I see two-spirit as part of a separate framework than LGBTQ. Uh, so I see two-spirit as primarily about gender and primarily about uh, my role in regard to my indigenous community. So it's really about how I can do multiply gendered activities in an indigenous context. Um, sometimes in my research, I've seen people use it as a sexuality identifier, like gay or lesbian or bisexual. Um, but historically, it was mostly about gender. So to me, I think that connection to uh, embodying masculinity and femininity is an important part of it. Yeah, I was a Halifax baby. I was born, as many people are, at the Grace Maternity um, back in 1973. I was, and uh, I lived in Halifax until I was about two or three years old. And then my parents moved out to the country. Um, and so I, I, we came to Halifax quite frequently. And so Halifax was the city. It was the place to be. Uh, and so I was very eager to go to university in Halifax because that was, uh, it was, it was sophisticated, <laughs> it was interesting, it had cool stuff. Uh, so yeah, it was a desirable location. Uh, I went to St. Mary's University. Uh, first few years there I lived in residence, and so I uh, was able to reach a lot of places in Halifax just by walking, and so that was a, a terrific time. Uh, well, I guess, you know, everyone has multiple coming out stories. There's like the time you come out to yourself, there's the time you come out to other people. Uh, for me, it happened with a brochure from the youth project. Uh, I was, I, I knew there was something going on. Uh, I was living in a women's residence. It's hard to live in a women's residence as a queer woman and not know there's something a little different. Um, and so I began to suspect that this uh, was queerness. And uh, I saw a brochure, uh, which asked something like, are you gay, lesbian, or bisexual? Or do you think you might be gay, lesbian, or bisexual? Or maybe even questioning was on there. Uh, and as soon as I saw the word bisexual, it explained everything. Because the puzzle for me had always been, well, I know I'm attracted to men, but I'm also attracted to women. And so that's not really a lesbian. What, what's going on here? Uh, and so as soon as I saw the word, I was like, that's the thing. That's the me. <laughs> so I'm, my first uh, coming out activities were really going to the youth project uh, and meeting Maura Donovan and finding out uh, really that there were other queer people in the world. Um, I mean. I knew that growing up, but it was always a depressed fest. Like the only time growing up I would hear about queer people is if something went wrong. Uh, you know, they've been attacked or they've uh, committed suicide or it was always a, a sort of shameful secret kind of uh, framework. And that wasn't how I felt about my queerness at all. I was very much like, <laughs> you know, fight the man. <laughs> uh, and then I sort of accidentally came out uh, by writing a letter to the newspaper. So in the mid-90s, there were a bunch of really homophobic people talking in the news and the media about queer people and just saying lies about us. Like Roseanne Skoke said we were unnatural and immoral in like the mid-90s. And so um, I think someone had written about this in the newspaper. There was an article in the Chronicle Herald and I wrote them an angry letter about it. And uh, they phoned me up at my parents' house and they said, hey, are you the Margaret Robinson who wrote this letter? And I said, yes, I am. And they're like, Do you, are you okay if we publish it? And I'm like, yeah, fine. Because I just wanted to correct these things that were being said about us in our communities. Um, and then it didn't really occur to me that they attach your name to the thing. And so it said Margaret Robinson Sheet Harbor. Well, there are a lot of Margaret Robinsons in the world and even in Nova Scotia, but there's only one in Sheet Harbor, Nova Scotia. <laughs> so I was suddenly out and my parents were getting phone calls and my, none of my family knew. <laughs> so it was awkward. Um, and then through the, the youth project, um, they did an article about how we were volunteering for Gay Line. Uh, and there was a picture of me and one of the other members that appeared on the cover of one of the newspapers. And then my, my more remote relatives were calling me up saying like, so I hear you're gay now. <laughs> it, it was a weird time, but we, we, we were all just so mad about the things people were saying about us that they were, they were trying to make our lives more difficult. And it, I don't know about other people, but I felt like this is, this is just not tolerable. It's, this is something we have to do something about.
it was awkward for a while. Um, my parents had been gay friendly and lesbian friendly in that sort of uh, liberal way typical of the people who grew up in the 60s. Uh, they, they felt like you know, uh, queer people were uh, unfortunate and we should feel sorry for them. And they told me that I was just trying to be different, that uh, gays and lesbians had real problems and I was just somehow like a tag along who was trying to insinuate myself into something that wasn't mine. And that was an attitude I encountered all over the place coming out as bi. Um, but, well, what did they know? They were just <laughs> straight people who <laughs> raised me. They didn't know what queer community was. Um, so, yeah, it was, it was frustrating at first. Um, my parents and I didn't talk for quite a while. Um, and then I think once they realized, like, this isn't, like, a, a fad or something, uh, things got better. I remember I came home one time, and my dad had collected clippings from the newspaper of anything queer-related, and he piled them in front of me, and he said, I, I got these for you. I thought you might be interested. And so that was his way, I think, of reaching out and trying to say, like, I'm sorry for being a jerk or whatever. Um, and they had run a, like a little flyer newspaper thing. And uh, he started putting the uh, outline or the gay line um, ads in the newspaper for free. Uh, just to, it was like a, a support line at the time. And he got angry letters from churches and he enjoyed arguing with them on the phone. <laughs> I, think, I think that was, part was uh, something he really liked. Um, but yeah, it, it took a while. My parents were, were not so bi friendly in the beginning. I had so many weird ideas about what being bisexual was, uh, like that we would just sleep with anybody, that it was some sort of free for all, uh, that I think the fear of uh, not being able to tell who's in what category comes up. So uh, it was easier to other gay and lesbian people because they were people they didn't often meet and they were people that they weren't going to be dating in some sort of scenario, they, they were separate. Um, but bisexuals could be anywhere, and so we were presented as these sort of undercover, sneaky people who were, I don't know, passing around sexually transmitted infections, or uh, we were blamed for a lot of stuff. Um, and so I think we kind of functioned as like a community boogeyman for like straight people, for queer people. Uh, in fact, it was only trans people I met who weren't biphobic. Uh, for a big chunk of the 90s. Um, and I think part of the coming out process has been about people um, pushing away from things that they're not. And so for a lot of gay and lesbian people, um, being able to push away from bisexuality was a way of coming out for them. And so I started to see biphobia as maybe a stage in some of their coming out practices, um, a way of saying that I'm, I'm not gonna be dating an other sex partner. And so I think they were maybe under a lot of pressure to do that by friends or family. And so I think, too, sometimes people come out as bisexual before they come out as something else. And so we were often framed as like a, I think as they said on Sex of the City, like we're a, a stop on the way to gay town or something. Like it, it was always very dismissive. Like what you are isn't real, what you are is temporary, and you're just doing it for attention from boys. And it was... It was always denigrated in some way that's highly gendered. <laughs> um, gay guys didn't seem to do this to bi guys in quite the same way. And so there was a lot of uh, just confusion about like, where are the edges of my community? Where are the, where's the bi community? Because there was no bi community that I could see. I would continually meet bi people. I remember one time we tried to have a, a bi group uh, spring off um, from the youth project. And our first meeting, we had like almost 40 people. And then the second meeting, no one came because they just weren't ready to give up their support in other areas of the community. Uh, they just couldn't be that visible to come out to a bi event on the regular. And so it was frustrating trying to um, figure out like, where do I belong here? And so I thought maybe my belonging has to be earned. So I did a lot of activism, um, but that didn't really make a difference. <laughs> it just meant you were exposed to biphobia more often because you were interacting with people more often. Um, but uh, in the beginning, it was tricky trying to figure out like, where do the bisexuals fit in all this? I think one of the few places in Halifax that you could go that was understood to be bi-friendly was the studio. Uh, I don't know if it was the official tagline, but the one I heard was, it doesn't, you don't have to be gay, lesbian, or bisexual to come to the studio, but it helps. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, there were, there were little pockets here and there, but for the most part, I didn't see bi community until I moved away.
Oh, the youth project. Gosh, I love the youth project so much, even today. Um, <laughs> so the youth project was a support group, and support, support and discussion, really, uh, for gay, lesbian, and bisexual people. And uh, it was the first place I went that was in any way queer. And so I remember going over to Quimpel Road, where they were meeting at the time in the Planned Parenthood office. And I was so nervous going in. I was hanging out in Canadian Tire and trying to talk myself up for it. And then I assured myself, no one will know you're queer just going in there. They'll think you're having an abortion. And that was much better because I was like, I would rather they think I'm having an abortion than that they know I'm bisexual. So uh, I went in and chatted with some people for a while and they were all super welcoming. And then um, a bunch of young queer people arrived and I think Maura Donovan and we just had a discussion talking about um, kind of music we listened to, movies we'd seen, coming out stuff. It was just whatever we wanted to talk about. And just having that little space, like it was a really small space, <laughs> um, where we could just be safely queer and be visible to other people, it made a huge difference. Um, I got to know other queer people and became friends with them. We did stuff together. She organized us all to go to a movie night. We all saw Philadelphia. Um, and I think she paid for it all. So like, what could that have cost? Um, and I think it was all part of her Master of Social Work project. Um, and so it just kept going and going. Um, Leanne Witchman was the executive director when I was there. And she was funny and she was smart and she was lovely and welcoming. Um, and we did activities. So we volunteered for Gayline uh, and we got training to do support counseling on the phone for people who were coming out or looking for connections. Um, and just being there in that space, waiting for the phone to ring was really cool and social. Um, and yeah, I made friends in the youth project that uh, I'm, I'm still well, friends with on Facebook, but like that uh, I still think fondly of today. Um, at the same time, it could be a really stressful space because people were coming out and people were often very biphobic. And so sometimes I would come home and I would cry about how people had been mean or people had not been supportive. Um, and it was difficult because uh, like there weren't other places to go. And so it was mixed, uh, but in terms of the, the support and the ability it gave us to think about let's do things as queer people, uh, that changed everything for me. Uh, she arranged for us to go and talk to high school classes and high school teachers during their in-service training. Uh, I remember being in one room in uh, a high school at a teacher in-service on the Eastern Shore, and one of the women in the room was friends with my mom. And I thought, oh no, she's gonna talk to my mom and tell her, and what do I do? And then she came up to me afterwards, because at first I thought, well, surely she won't recognize me. Um, but then she came up to me afterwards. She said, you're Heather's daughter, aren't you? And I'm like, yes. And she came out to me. <laughs> so I was so relieved. I thought, oh, okay, you're not going to tell my mom about this, are you? Because now we're on equal footing here. We, um, so yeah, it was, it was a great time to be, to be young and queer with the youth project because uh, they made it not just like a secret thing. They made it something we could go out and do stuff about. Yeah, it was a difference. There were so many things to make you angry, like just homophobic people writing into the newspapers or people on the news saying homophobic things or just the, every system you encountered. It was like they had never thought that you might exist or that you might access services of any kind. And so even things that would have been easy to provide for say same-sex couples or queer people in general, none of that existed. Um, and sometimes when you would ask for things like that, people would become very angry and defensive and even aggressive about it. And so it was like you were just trying to fight to have a space to live, to, to exist in the world. And so we had to do some kind of activism. Um, I got involved with Pride Halifax for a few years and it was so small, like, uh, but I had no frame of reference. And so, you know, a, a parade with 40 people in it may as well be a parade with 4,000 people in it to me. Um, but at the same time, I knew, like, there are more queer people than this, but we're the only ones who don't have something to risk in marching. Like, you know, other people had mortgages to worry about or maybe other things with their job. And so being out in a march or being seen could be a big deal. Uh, so I we used to joke a lot of people who couldn't be in the march or in the parade would be in front of the library because that was a safe public space where you could see the parade go by. And so every time the parade would turn that corner and, and see the library folks, we would all wave because we thought like those are our people who can't be with us yet. 
And so like it, it was small. I remember we were we were grand marshals with the youth project one year, and uh, I think the only float in the parade was handmade. A drag queen had made this platform on wheels and put a big shoe on top of it that was a chair. And she was sitting in the shoe looking fabulous. And then I think people were pulling it, but it wasn't like on a vehicle. It was just like a, like a wooden platform with some wheels. Um, but it was in every picture because it was the only visual thing in the march. Everyone else was like in shorts and a t-shirt with a sign or something because um, it was a political time. Like politicians, the people who got elected were saying terrible things about us. So like it, how are they supposed to represent you? Like, you know, if you lived in central Nova and the most homophobic person visible on television is your political representative, that must be awful. Well, I think they have a parade listing. And so... Um, I think, I'm pretty sure the youth project got together a group to go into the parades in the beginning. And so I would have gone in with them initially. And then in terms of organizing Halifax Pride stuff, um, I was just really looking for more by visibility, more opportunities for that. But I didn't know how to do anything. And so like they, in many cases, some of them didn't know how to do anything either, but we learned it together. We just figured it out. And so I like that do-it-yourself element. That really appealed to me, and that became part of my activism from that point on. Like, okay, we don't know how to do this, but we know what the end point is supposed to look like. So let's figure out what we need to do to get from where we are now to there was a parade or there was a march. Um, and so, yeah, it, it, it was a training ground, really, a, a place where I, I learned some good things and some bad things and then used those, uh, those things that I learned to go and do activism elsewhere. And so... I don't think I could have like chaired the Dyke March if I hadn't been part of Pride uh, in Halifax because uh, there were things I knew about how a Pride functioned that helped me going in. Uh, and it gave me a way to uh, kind of shame some cities that thought they were a little more sophisticated than Halifax by saying, well, you know, Halifax's Pride is the gay, lesbian, bisexual, and trans Pride. So how come you're still the gay and lesbian Pride? It's a little, little, old-fashioned, right? Um, and so by, by being able to show off the inclusivity and advancement of Halifax in our eyes, to be able to say, you know, let's, let's get it together and, and be more inclusive here too, um, I think that really helped because they, they made an effort to include everyone. Because Halifax was so small, uh, when you start chopping the community up, you'd have, you'd have few, too few people to run a parade, really. Um, and so it was a little more inclusive here than it was in a bigger city. Uh, well, it's all about trying to figure out who's like us and who isn't. Uh, and even within the us, uh, there are all kinds of different ways of being lesbian or all kinds of different ways of being gay. And so the homogenous vision that we sometimes have about a community, that itself is a fiction. And so we, we didn't have a lot of resources, so you needed to kind of group together for things. But there would be tensions between people who wanted a night where there's a drag show and people who wanted a night where it's a uh, leather bears or people who wanted to dance all evening and people who wanted to perform. And so like what people are looking for from even a social activity, uh, it varies greatly. And so I think sometimes people would end up with accidentally queer social groups. Um, like I know sometimes it would turn out um, that some of my friends uh, that I met through the youth project, um, a lot of their high school friend group had turned out to be queer, um, but they had not really talked about this or acknowledged this or even considered it at the time. Um, and so I think people kind of, I'll say naturally, but isn't that loaded statement, uh, they naturally uh, move toward hanging out with people that have things in common with them. And so sometimes that creates a community and uh, really you need a community if the mainstream is not responding to your needs in any way and they weren't. And so I think as communities become less essential to get your daily needs met, um, they become more optional. And so then people have different things they're looking for from them. Like they weren't looking for a space today necessarily to just be queer with other people. They might be looking for something really specific, like I want to do knitting with queer people, or I, uh, you know, I want to play Dungeons and Dragons, but everyone must be queer. <laughs> uh, and so I think there's there's different expectations about what you get from a social organization or a social group, and like the the issues change over time. 
So like bisexual issues about visibility might be similar to gay and lesbian issues about visibility. Um, but then we're affected by different elements. Like um, lesbians weren't scapegoated as spreading AIDS the way bisexual communities were. And so the, you end up with differences that can become quite significant. And so it was, especially if people start policing each other in different ways. And so it was, um, you were forced to be together as a big group, even when it wasn't always viable. So in 1997, uh, my partner and I moved to Toronto. I was going to graduate school to do my master's and then my PhD. And then uh, we lived there and I worked. And so the, um, I think I was there for maybe 20 years in Toronto. And so that made a big difference because Toronto, um, well, it didn't have bi community when I was there initially, but it, it certainly developed soon after I arrived. Uh, and I had a hand in that too. Um, but when I first arrived in Toronto, I was looking to do the kind of activism I had done in Halifax. So I did things like uh, join the university groups and I, they had a bi group called Barbecue at the University of Toronto. And so I went to some of those events and that was interesting because it was just, it was just bisexual people in barbecue. And um, so University of Toronto had LGBT oat, I think. I don't think there was a Q in it at the time. And that was for everybody. And then a splinter group of that was barbecue and they did activities, including barbecues. <laughs> uh, so they were like bisexual questioning and queer. And uh, it was meant to be sort of a safe place for bi people and it was, and I met some good friends through there. Um, but it was on campus and we were surrounded by the gay village because the residence was right downtown. And so there were a lot of opportunities to go to other things. And so, I mean, the pride parade is enormous in Toronto. It mind-blowingly huge. Um, but the Dyke March seemed a more manageable thing. And so we went to the Dyke March a couple of times. And then I got a call from a friend who was saying their, um, one of, their roommate had gone to Dyke March to complain about something and uh, had, or had gone to Pride Toronto to complain about something and ended up getting voluntold into the role of chairing the Dyke March. And uh, that they were going to lose their mind if we didn't come in and help them because now it was all on them. Uh, and there had been some articles in the newspaper about how there weren't any women volunteering for this and we needed someone to do it or we're going to lose the march. And I thought, well, I don't want you to lose the march. So a bunch of us volunteered and, and really created a, a march using the little bits we knew from other activities. So uh, drawing on what I'd seen in uh, Halifax, I was like, okay, well, we need to get like a permit of some sort. We need, but they had done the permit already. So all we needed was to organize. Um, and so that was more viable. Although like the committee fought a lot, it was a real biphobic period, a real transphobic period. And so uh, we were having basic arguments in the meetings about like, do trans women belong in the march? Should bisexuals be permitted in the march? And it's like, we're in the room and you're having this debate as if it doesn't concern our lives and our right to be here in our community when we're here to organize the event. It was infuriating. Um, but by then I was used to, how do you navigate around biphobia? And so I, I had some skills, I had some tools to use. Um, but then coming back to Halifax, I came back to a whole different Halifax. Like when we left in 97, uh, Halifax was going through a recession, like things were economically depressing here and uh, stores were shutting down. There had been places that were supposed to open that hadn't opened and were now the signs saying opening soon are looking sad and old and like it, it was a, a rough time. And so it was, in my opinion, at the time I left, I thought this place is racist and homophobic and I just can't wait to be gone. And then coming back, it was like, this place is multicultural and queer friendly. <laughs> and like, it, it, was, it was like seeing your ex and now they're really hot or something. It was, it was a whole different Halifax. Um, and I, I really like this Halifax. I like it so much more. Um, it, people are doing things here. It's interesting. Uh, there are small businesses. And, and so that's a, a more fun and vibrant place to be than a place where it seems like everything is closing down. And, so now I teach university and I see, I see people who are queer positive and trans positive who have nothing at risk in that. Like they're straight cis men who are, who are on side. And I didn't see that when I was younger. 
um, no one came out. I remember in one of the youth project events, uh, we were at a high school and this cocky straight guy said, well, what's in it for me? Like, why should I bother not being homophobic? And everyone sort of looked at each other and I was like, well, bisexual women won't want to sleep with you if you're homophobic. <laughs> it's like, it just, it was the first thing that occurred to me, but like people were always asking like, well, what's in it for me? As if, you know, treating other people like human beings is something you have to be bribed into or something. Um, so I don't see as much of that anymore because of the, the group of people I'm with. Um, Cause statistically people who are pursuing higher education tend to not score as high on markers of homophobia or things like that. And so I'm, I'm seeing mostly critical thinkers, but um, it can sometimes create this illusion that we've somehow solved all the homophobia and biphobia and transphobia in the world. Um, and then, you know, I'll read the news. I'm like, what is wrong with you people? I feel like we fixed this already and now you're doing that. So dyke marches happen all over the world. Um, a dyke march is basically just a march of uh, usually people reclaiming the word dyke. And so for me, I was always adamant, like, okay, if it's about reclaiming dyke, then anyone who gets policed by dyke uh, should be allowed to be in it. Um, that anyone who might get called dyke or, you know, if someone shouts dyke across a parking lot late at night and you know they mean you, you should come to the dyke march. Um, and so it was really a way to focus in on that intersectional element that queer women were experiencing around um, sexual violence, around uh, homophobic violence, around lesbophobic, biphobic, transphobic violence. Um, it was about that gender intersection of being queer and also othered in a feminine way. And so for me, it was about uh, highlighting that because when I, did organism, when, I, when I did organizing with gay men, it was often about celebrating queerness. Because um, that's where the guys that I was working with were at in their lives. You know, they were young, they were looking to meet other guys. Um, and so for them, it was mostly a social sexual events. But the women I was working with, they were often experiencing multiple oppressions. They were economically oppressed. There was violence. There were just uh, you know, social othering. Um, all kinds of things were happening. And so they didn't have that kind of social power that men did. And so dyke marches were necessary to even sometimes get your voices heard in relation to larger pride activities. So that's certainly the case with Toronto where part of the reason there's a dyke march is because the pride parade was mostly male focused uh, in the opinion of the people who started the dyke march for sure. But uh, yeah, we started marches in other places too. We had a, a daughter march in Buffalo. Uh, we went down there and got to, to attend that. That was terrific to see other people running a dyke march with the manual that we made. That was awesome. Um, and we uh, sent our manual off to Vancouver when they were organizing theirs. And so I, I feel like we, we are connected to other dyke marches as well. Um, and there was a history too, like people have expectations based on what dyke marches they've seen elsewhere look like. So, you know, they expect there to be women on motorcycles at the front of the march. Um, and so there are certain um, uh, aesthetic elements to a dyke march. Like you don't expect floats. You don't expect a lot of vehicles. You expect mostly people marching and you expect political uh, opinions. So signs, things like that. Um, so I remember in Toronto, we had queer women coloring the century and the police wanted them to take down their signs and not use them in the parade or the march because they spoke out against uh, police racism. And I remember one of the cops was reported to have said to one of the women, like, this isn't a march or an event about uh, racism. It's about promoting homosexuality. <laughs> I was like, oh, you so <laughs> missed the ball on this. Like, um, so yeah, it was a, an experience to, to create a space that was really about that experience of being particularly targeted in the world. I think when I left Toronto, the Dyke March was still the Dyke March, but there was a trans march as well. And so uh, people were, we were trying to schedule, well, I wasn't organizing it then, but then the people who were organizing the Dyke March were trying to schedule so that they could also attend the trans march in solidarity and stuff like that or to go to the march and, and be on the sides. And so the, when I left, it was very much like uh, every group is soon going to have some sort of a march maybe. Like we saw marching as really a, a more 
and an indicator of a more political attitude uh, compared, say, with the parade. And so, you know, there could be lots of groups in our communities that have political issues that a march could address. And so, w when I left, things hadn't smushed together or anything, but there had been um, a new, Trans March was relatively new at the time. So a queer space is often a space that is uh, separate from other spaces because those other spaces, the public spaces we'll call them, are not friendly to queers. And so like when I first came out, I went to Rumors, um, which was the, the queer bar of the day. And rumors. <laughs> rumors was cool. Rumors was a secret. Because I, I don't, what I heard was um, in order to avoid getting raided by the cops or whatever, they had set themselves up as a private club. And so that gave you different legal location. Now, I don't know if any of that's true, but that was the story. And so when you arrived at Rumors, um, so you were going to the scary part of town because Rumors was on Gottagen Street. And Gottagen Street was less white than other streets in Halifax. And so it was perceived by anyone who was talking to us about it as like, oh, that's a scary place to go. And so it was great because it meant that most of those preppy people who were afraid of <laughs> dark skin didn't come in that area. And so you were less likely to get uh, stopped or questioned by people that you might know from work or school. And so um, it was a good location for a queer bar. And it was, um, it was a little, like a, it had clearly been, uh, this rumors was in a space that was probably really cool looking at one time. But by the time we got there, it was at the end of its glamor lifespan. And so it had an element of faded glamor about it that was itself really cool. When I walked in the door, there was a woman in a tuxedo and she was there to take our names and welcome us to rumors. And that to me was just like the epitome of cool. Uh, and so I, f like a fool, I just wrote my name on the thing. She said, we're a private club, would you please sign in? And so I just wrote my name and then I'm looking like who else is here and I look at the list and it's all fake names. <laughs> it's like, you know, Elvis Presley or like just names people made up. And then I was like, oh, are we not supposed to put our real name on this? And then you get inside and maybe it had been a movie theater. It was huge. It was an enormous space and it had like velvet curtains and there was an enormous dance floor and then an elevated bar at the back. And all the women were hanging out in the elevated bar at the back. Um, but of course, in lesbian style of the time, it was all very um, flannel. And so I was like, these women remind me of my mom. And so it was a little weird. It was like, this is not going to work for me as like a pickup space. Because I came from a rural space, and that was the lesbian look of the period. Uh, it was the 90s, flannel was in, jeans. Um, and so it was, um, the dance floor was filled with um, men and drag queens. And so I think my first crush at Rumors turned out to be <laughs> the six foot tall drag queen. <laughs> um, and then later I, I got to know the guy who performed her uh, and didn't realize it was him until I was chatting with him one day while he was putting his makeup on. And I'm like, you're the hot blonde <laughs> at Rumors. Um, so yeah, we had, we had this amazing space. Um, and it was, it was difficult to go by yourself because if you didn't know people there, uh, a lot of people already seem to kind of be there in their social groups. And so to just be by yourself at a group that big can be just as alienating as being the only queer in a high school or something. And so I, I didn't go very often because I didn't have a group to go with. But um, when I did have a group to go with later for, uh, through university and stuff, we tended to go to the studio and a couple of times we went to Reflections. Um, although Reflections was mostly, in my experience, about drag shows and dancing, and um, sometimes you'd go and nothing would be happening. It would just be a big empty room. And so I didn't go to Reflections as often. But for me, Rumors was like, I, I felt like I just got to come in at the tail end of something that must have been magnificent, because it was amazing when I went. Uh, a space that is just open to queer people, um, that's just what regular space should be. So like, you know, lots of businesses will put up a sticker and that's awesome. I know that I can go in there and just be myself and I don't have to worry as much. 
but uh, that's just how things should function in the world. <laughs> uh, a space that is just for queer people, uh, everything in that space can be tailored for queerness. Whereas most of the other spaces we go to in our lives, even if they're inclusive, they're not really designed with us in mind. They're often performed or function with us in mind because of the people they're wanting to be inclusive, but rarely are they ever designed for queer people. And so that otherness of always being a secondary thought or uh, an afterthought, um, it, it's not there. And you don't have to pat anyone on the back and give them cookies for not being homophobic or whatever. Like it's, it's less work in queer space sometimes. At the same time, queer space is often fraught with biphobia and transphobia. And so that can be an issue. Um, but by space, um, the few times I've experienced that was amazing because uh, you didn't have to explain everything. Like the people in the room just understand right away. You can make an oblique reference to something and everyone just gets it. Uh, and so like the, the kind of conversations can skip that 101 and immediately go into like 201, 301, 401. Um, whereas sometimes with queer people, I would try to socialize, but if they weren't bisexual also, they would ask me weird questions, especially when we got a little drunk. I remember one guy leaned in and he was like, so what's the deal anyway? Like, how does it work? I'm like, what do you mean? It's like, dude, you're, you're gay. You know how it works. And he's like, no, no, like, like with, with women, like, <laughs> it's like, oh dear, please, no. So yeah, like you get these weird um, objectifying questions sometimes. Um, and there'd be certain dynamics that you couldn't participate in as a bisexual person in queer space. So uh, gay men and lesbians would often flirt with each other and like dirty dance and all kinds of stuff, but they wouldn't do that with bisexuals because the bisexual might take it seriously or like it, part of what made that activity work was the fact that everyone understood that they weren't interested in each other, that it was a performance. And so if there might be this understanding of like, well, I might be attracted to that person, then I couldn't function in that kind of role, right? So it, uh, yeah, queer space is, as a bisexual person, they're not always ideal because there's these assumptions like, oh, we're all safe here, but sometimes you're not. Um, and I'm sure that's similar for other types of people who live on the margins of queer community or perceived that way by others. And so it's a space that is accepting of queerness. They might not know anything about queerness. Like they might not know very much at all. Um, and so that can be difficult because just because they're willing to serve you doesn't mean they know how. And so that can be frustrating. Like those spaces, it takes up a lot of energy to always explain yourself. I always want to believe that if somebody says we're open to all queer people that they mean it. However, in practice, people often don't know where their edges of tolerance are. And so they sometimes invite people into a space that they're not prepared to to really welcome those people as who they are. And so that can be frustrating if, if you're that person who's not really getting welcomed the way other people are or for whom th the space, maybe there are structural barriers of some sort or there are other elements to the way people interact that are just not working for you. Um, and, and then when you maybe raise those issues, they say, well, these, uh, you know, they have reasons for it, but you don't think they're good reasons. Like I remember being in spaces that were transphobic, uh, that were intended to support queer women. And when I would mention this, uh, they would say, well, we can't, you know, we'd love to include trans women, but it would be so confusing to lesbians who come in from, usually they would say Scarborough or Mississauga, someplace they perceived as less uh, advanced as, as downtown Toronto. And they would use this imaginary future lesbian as sort of a, a reason for not including actual trans women who were looking for support. And so there were some groups that I, I went to a couple of meetings, but they were so negative that even though their, their verbiage was about inclusivity, they didn't function that way at all. And so yeah, I remember leaving some places and just immediately going to the bathroom and crying for a while until it was all right to leave and being like, all right, we won't be going back there again then. <laughs> and then sometimes people would try to be inclusive, but it would come out in really weird ways. Like I remember um, just before we moved away, we had joined this group that was just starting up, Nova Scotia Rainbow Action Project. And it was supposed to fight politically against folks like Roseanne Skoke. Um, and they wanted to eliminate that Halifax-centric element to a lot of queer organizing. 
And so I remember our first meeting, we went out to, uh, I think, the property of one of the members who lived out somewhere in New Glasgow. And so we were driving and driving and driving, and it was getting late at night. Uh, and finally we got there, and most of the attendees were from Halifax, except <laughs> this <laughs> host. And I thought, this is so weird. Like, the idea, I agree. Okay, let's, let's be less focused in on Halifax. But if everyone in the room is still from that same area, then you're, what you're trying to accomplish didn't happen. And so it just, we spent so much time arguing about like what letters should be in the name, what should we call ourselves, who's included, who's not included. And after a while, it just takes so much energy fighting people that you feel like are part of your own community to just see you as a person. And so by the time I got to Toronto, I was really looking to make a change. And so I, I tended to do a lot more bisexual organizing. And so my, my I think, foray in Pride Toronto was like the end of that burnout arc. <laughs> right? Like, just because someone is different in some way doesn't mean that it's their job to educate the world about that difference. Like, people have a right to just exist and it's not everyone else's business what they do and how they are. Like, it's, yeah, the, the kind of, um, well, I call it policing, but like just the surveillance sometimes and the uh, idea that there's one right way to do everything. Maybe it's in the indigenous uh, aspect, but that just always struck me as just not right. <laughs> that uh, there's something uh, oppressive about expecting everyone to be similar, that you should accept that people are gonna be different and uh, welcome and celebrate that difference and telling people how to, how to be a better lesbian, <laughs> a better bisexual or uh, whatever it is they're trying to accomplish, like that's, that's not for other people to decide. Like it's for each individual to decide how their sexuality is gonna manifest and what kind of labels they're gonna use and what it's gonna mean for them. That it doesn't have to mean the same for everybody. So I had a friend from high school. We have almost the same attractions if we were gonna score them on a measure. Um, but we have very different identity labels and very different attitudes toward what queerness means in our lives. And so it's, it's almost like we're not in the same community because we're so vastly different in those ways. And so there are, there's a lot of diversity that I feel like gets unfairly quashed because people wanna belong. Trying to create an inclusive space is not easy either. Like I, I've tried doing that and sometimes you make decisions that seem right at the time, but then it turned out, oh, well, you know, you held that event in a space that has three stairs and so, it's not accessible or you know yeah your event was accessible but you know if anyone wanted to go to the bathroom they were out of luck like there are, there are lots of ways in which elements that aren't immediately part of my experience could get missed and so i think you know, group organizing is sometimes really helpful that way because um you know one driven individual can accomplish an enormous amount but they're not going to see everything and so you know if you're just a, a one person show you're you're going to miss a lot of stuff and uh if you're not open to people saying you know hey i have some constructive criticism <laughs> about your last event uh like it's difficult too because people don't often say thank you when you organize an event and so you might not be getting any positive feedback and you're only getting negative feedback and that can burn people out really fast because um, you know they have this vision of like i'll provide that thing and everyone will love me and no, instead everyone's just mad that you didn't do it the way they would have done it. And so it's, I, I understand why people feel upset when they get criticized about stuff, but like, if you're not open to the criticism, did you really mean it when you said you wanted to be inclusive or was that just for cookies and kudos? Like there's, there's a performative element to it definitely sometimes where if they're not willing to actually do the work to make the goal happen, how committed are they to the goal? How was it the studio? Oh, the studio was weird. Uh, so I don't know exactly what the studio were intending to accomplish, but what it was like to go there, uh, I went with my friends from the English program at St. Mary's, and so they're arty um, and queer friendly, but maybe not queer identified. And so I was, 
to my way of thinking at the time, the only queer in the group, and but they would go to the studio. And so the studio was a place you could go with your straight friends, but be a queer person with your straight friends. And um, it wasn't always great for straight guys because they didn't know in many cases what to do if a guy hit on them, but that was the understanding of going to the studio. It was like, some men may hit on you. And the under, you know, women go through this all the time in the world. They get hit on all over the place. Um, but somehow, <laughs> sometimes straight men didn't know what to do with it. So um, you would get a lot of uh, more queer friendly straight men who could handle stuff like, you know, someone expressing an interest that isn't uh, returned. Or you would end up with uh, bi guys or questioning guys. And so it was a, a really mixed space. Uh, there was an upstairs and a downstairs and a bunch of stairs going between. And so that made it kind of weird. Like there was a bar upstairs and I think a bar above that even. But most people went to the middle bar and then sometimes down to the basement where the bathrooms were. And I think there was a pool table there. And so it was uh, crowded. And so you were really cramped in with everybody else. But they had a little dance space and I had lots of great evenings dancing there with friends. Um, I also had a really humiliating moment at the studio where a guy came up to me and he said, hey, can I get you a drink? And I was like, yeah, sure, I'll have a beer. And he brings the beer back and he goes, that'll be, you know, 450 or whatever outrageous amount of beer cost at the time. It turned out he was a waiter. <laughs> so that was a little humiliating. I was like, okay, you're not offering me a, a beer in some sort of potential transactional relationship scenario. No, you're, you're just wait staff. Gotcha. Uh, and then I once made the mistake of wearing a, a dark skirt and white shirt and got mistaken for waitstaff myself. Um, but the studio was, uh, it was pop music. It was uh, Pet Shop Boys and it was um, flashing lights and, and disco balls. And they were clearly trying really hard to be young and hip. And sometimes it really worked. <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, you know, you put a lot of young people in a space together and give them lots of alcohol and music, uh, it could be a really fun place to be. Sometimes it was dangerous. Uh, I remember being with a male partner and I had cut my hair short and we got called fags by a, a group uh, in a car driving by and we were loaded down with groceries. We had just come from the grocery store and so we were like really, everything was too heavy and we were trying to move it all back to our apartment in Clayton Park and uh, it was it was scary because I thought if they stop, are they going to care that we're not both guys? Like I don't know if they would. And like getting beaten up for being not the kind of queer they thought I was <laughs> seems a little strange. But uh, sometimes there would be moments where people would yell things at you. Um, sometimes there were also great moments though, like same thing with the, the short hair. I got mistaken for a guy when I was coming out of a movie in um, Park Lane Theater and someone was giving out free gum and he was like, oh, would you like some free gum, sir? And I was like, sure. <laughs> um, but it was, it was interesting to kind of be there and as I thought at the time, be queer and out in different spaces. Um, and you know, I'd wear buttons or things like that, but Looking back now, it's like, you know, not everyone knows what those mean. You have to get really close sometimes to see them. Uh, and so it was really, in retrospect, I think, more a signal for other queer people than it was for straight people. Like, I remember being on a bus uh, coming along Roby Street, and there was someone I knew on the bus, but I couldn't figure out where I knew him from. And we kept looking at each other, and finally he came over and he said, I think I know you. And I'm like, I know, right? It's driving me crazy. And I was like, okay, so could it be from this or that or nothing? And it's like, is it from Youth Project maybe? And he said, no, but it's something like that. And I'm like, we're coming out to each other in very subtle ways on this bus trip of like, yes, we're, we know each other from something queer. But like in that time period, you would go to anything queer. Like I went to a group for Catholic lesbians just because it was queer. And the little nun who ran it was delightful and so welcoming. And she taught us to meditate. And I went to uh, like groups that people held in their home. Back then, a pride event would be like, we're going to so-and-so's house and they're gonna make us barbecue. <laughs> or like we, you know, we would go to Ross Bootlier's house to eat watermelon or something. It's, it was very, like home style and so you would just go to anything queer because there weren't a lot of queer things period and so sometimes you'd find yourself in places that um, 
were not really something you might have chosen to go to if you hadn't been queer. Uh, and that was a bit of an adventure. There, that, there was a fun element to that. I remember going to some kind of, I think it was religious, maybe some sort of religious queer group, um, but you had to look for the rainbow uh, wind chime on the house. They wouldn't give you a number, they would give you the street, and then the instructions told you to like, look for the wind chime. So it felt a bit like being a spy, you know? I'm going to secret locations and meeting with strangers. <laughs> and it, was, it, was, it had an element of excitement about it that maybe I wouldn't have had if I hadn't been queer. Yeah, yeah, when I think about like, the times I've uh, gone into, uh, I mean, if you saw it in a, in a movie or a television show, you'd be like, do you not go to a remote location with a bunch of strangers? Like, what, you're looking to, to end up on Criminal Minds or something here. Like, it, it wasn't safe. The things we did were not at all smart or safe. But, uh, you know, you would go to places with queer people because those were the people that really got you the most. And so, yeah, I, <laughs> I got in cars I probably <laughs> should have thought twice about and went to places with strangers because there's an event there. Um, but, like, you know, we were all young people. We didn't have a car. So if someone had a vehicle they could drive places, uh, that made a huge difference to what you could attend. And so you would go with people just because they had a vehicle. Um, but there was a, a safety in the group too, like the, you weren't supposed to leave people behind. And so sometimes we go to events and someone would get too drunk and they can't take care of themselves and the group would make sure that that person got home. The number of people I've walked home from events, like it, it's, it staggers me. <laughs> it's like we, you're supposed to look out for each other because this is your community. And like if, if you can't help people be safe, like what's the point of the community? And so. It, I think there were a lot of people who took that really safely, really seriously. Um, yeah, and I think maybe it leaked out into the broader community too. Uh, I remember being in Toronto with a friend of mine from Dyke March and some drunk straight guy came up to us and he was too drunk to use the ATM. But he was like, you're lesbians, lesbians will help me. You're, you're good people because you're lesbians. And he kept saying it and I was like, what is he on about? And so he told us his bank, password and gave us his card and he's like i just need 20 bucks to get home and i'm just like dude never do this with other people like this was not smart but like we were gonna take his money and, like leave him homophobic the rest of his life like yeah, it's your right it's your <laughs> we're representing the community here we can't can't mistreat a fella but yeah like it i think there's there's an expectation uh, that comes with community about taking care of each other. And so when you don't feel taken care of by community, like that, that hurts, especially if you've gone out of your way to take care of other people. Like I remember I, some community member ended up sleeping in my office for six months <laughs> because she, she was living in an unsafe place. And like in retrospect, it's like, why did I do that? That was weird. But like at the time, you just want people to not be in danger. Oh my gosh. Enjoy the ride. <laughs> yeah, don't get, don't get so worked up about people who hate you for reasons that have nothing to do with you. Like, it's not about you. It's really about them. Uh, it took me a long time to realize that many of the biphobic lesbians I encountered were trying to be helpful to me. They thought I was stuck coming out in my process as a lesbian, and they were trying to help me come out as lesbian because that was what they had done. And so when my experience looked different, they thought, well, you've wandered off the path here. You've gotten stuck in bisexual. Um, they didn't realize I was on a different path entirely. And so it was, it was weird. But I think I would tell young me, like, don't get so angry all the time. Like, think about what might be going on in those other people's heads that are encouraging them to think this way. And look for the things that you have in common, to look for like the common values, because uh, I think many of those people that I experienced as biphobic were in fact really caring because they were going out of their way as they thought trying to help people. And so I think if we had maybe focused on our mutual desire to support our communities, that might have been a better conversation than digging into why should bisexuals be here and your label is not authentic and <laughs> all of the rest of that, which was not at all fun. Because when you're first coming out, you don't know the answers to any of these challenges. Like, I didn't get 
you don't come out by and immediately know all the arguments to address biphobia. Uh, you just know that it's a bunch of crap. <laughs> like you don't exactly know why. Um, so I spent way too much thinking in my own head, trying to figure out like if I could just say the right thing, I could get a girlfriend. If I could just say the right thing, I could have a friends group. If, uh, and then realizing it really wasn't as much about me as I thought it was. I guess I'm proud of the way that the youth project has continued. Uh, I, I know young people today who are involved in the youth project. I, well, I was on an airplane sitting next to Maura Donovan, uh, and we were chatting about how the youth project had this taken on a life of its own and, and grown, and like her kid's almost an adult now. Um, and so she's got this other baby, which is the youth project that is now also an adult. And I think it's amazing. Like she, I think she's from the US, maybe Boston or something, but she just found herself here in this place and made a thing that she saw missing. And I'm incredibly proud of the work she did. And I'm incredibly proud of the, the people she brought together, like uh, the, the connections that she made there. Um, some of the people I met through the Youth Project were amazing folks, and they helped me be a better person. And I, I'm, I'm still impressed with all the things that they did and the stuff we were able to do together. Uh, yeah, I think Youth Project by far. I spent a lot of time looking for role models, and I think I would tell them, uh, don't put as much effort into finding a role model. Be your role model. Be the person that uh, you think you would like to see as a role model. Be that person yourself. Because uh, growing up as a bi person in the 90s, it seemed like you couldn't find a bisexual person in history who hadn't committed suicide or uh, who died in a knife fight. or like Everything was just a depressed fest. And so sometimes it was like, I don't want to learn about my own history because everything that I uncover is unpleasant. Uh, and it's hard to be in a, that space where it seems like uh, you're inheriting this uh, wealth of awfulness, <laughs> depression, and anxiety. Um, so I think really, you know, they say living well is the best revenge. Uh, like, have a good life. Take care of yourself. Take care of your friends. Um, don't spend time with people who are mean to you. Uh, That'll work itself out on their end through time and, and their own efforts, but uh, you can't change people and make them different. Uh, you can just let people learn the lessons they're going to learn. And uh, trying to change everyone so that they like you or so that they accept your, your group, um, it doesn't always work. And so um, being yourself and being a good person, I think that's, that's the best activation.